Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, um, and welcome to this rather grand committee room here at the House of Commons. Um, on behalf of the Food Foundation, the Food Ethics Council, and the Food Research Collaboration, uh, welcome to this debate. Um, we're really considering today the implications of both Brexit and Remain on the future of food, farming, the environment, and health. Uh, my name is Charlotte Smith and I'm the chair today, so it's my job to make sure that we do all that and get out of this room by 7 o'clock. So that'll be all right. Uh, it's a, a fairly um, set pattern that we're going to stick to, hopefully, uh, today. We're first going to hear from our three experts, all academics and experts in their field, and then they will be quizzed by our three MPs. Now, the brighter among you will notice that we only have two, uh, one MEP and one MP. Um, another MP is on his way, um, so please forgive him when he comes barreling through in just a moment. Uh, we have Labour, Conservative and UK represented here today. Um, and then it will be your moment, ladies and gentlemen, because we'll open it up to the floor and you can ask questions and we can debate some of the points that we will have heard. Um, just one note, there are no fire alarm practices uh, planned for today, so if you do hear an alarm, um, it will be the real thing and staff from the House of Commons here will um, point us in the right direction. So, uh, let's start, and let's start, I suppose, at the beginning of the food chain. Um, what would a Brexit mean for British agriculture? Uh, professor Wynne Grunt from the University of Warwick is with us. He's Professor of Politics and, from my point of view, is fairly much known as the go-to man on the common agricultural policy. Okay, thank you. Well, when a group of academic experts, which included Fiona and Alan Swinbank sitting over there, and farmers, which I chaired, got together under the auspices of the Yorkshire Agricultural Society to consider the implications of Brexit for UK farming. We expected there to be complexities and uncertainties, but they were even greater than we anticipated. Now, our key objective was to provide information that farmers and others concerned with agriculture could use to question politicians during the referendum campaign. We also felt that agriculture and food had not been given sufficient attention during the negotiations, nor has it really been given as much uh, attention as it merits in the subsequent debates. Should Brexit occur, our report draws attention to the issues that will have to be considered in exit negotiations, because the report and the executive summary of the report can be accessed online. Now, of course, there is no precedent for a member state leaving the European Union. So we don't know how the so-called Article 50 process, which leads to an exit settlement, would work out. What seems very likely is that the two years that are provided for negotiations in the treaty would all have to be used, given the various relationships that would have to be disentangled and reorganised. The best deal from a UK perspective would be to negotiate a free trade area with the European Union. This would mean, for example, that sheep meat exported to France, which is exported in quite a substantial quantity, would not face tariffs. Supporters of Brexit would argue that it would be in the interest of the European Union to negotiate such a deal, given the volume of trade with the UK. However, the EU would not want to give too generous a deal, as it might encourage other member states to think that leaving would be a viable option and start a process of disintegration of the EU. The UK would almost certainly be expected to make a contribution to the cost of the single market, although this would be substantially less than the current contribution that the UK makes to the EU. Because the remaining member states would want a level playing field with the UK, they would also expect us to adhere to single market rules, although I think how broad the definition of single market rules would be would have to be a matter for negotiation. Now, of course, the, the UK would remain a member of the EU while these negotiations were taking place, and the existing subsidies paid to farmers would continue for that two-year period. Our working party did consider the existing Pillar 1 subsidies, the general subsidies that are given to farmers, would be vulnerable once Britain left the EU. For many farmers, not least those in upland areas, these subsidies represent the difference between making a profit and making a loss. In an ideal world, farming would not be so dependent on subsidies. But one has to consider the volatility of world markets, and the extent to which the food chain is dominated by the buying power of the large supermarkets. 
It has been argued that the savings that will be made from not having to contribute to the EU budget would enable these subsidies to continue to be paid at the current level. However, the Treasury has long been opposed to them and has had them in its sights as market distorting. It is evident from the budget statement that there are considerable pressures for greater reductions in public expenditure. The subsidies will not disappear overnight, but they are quite likely to be phased out. However, as far as Pillar 2 subsidies are concerned for agri-environmental schemes and rural development, we think those are far less vulnerable. They are embedded in contractual arrangements which extend beyond 2020. Moreover, there is a domestic coalition of support for them from environmental and conservation lobbies. Some farmers think that there will be considerable reduction in the regulatory burden outside the European Union. However, insofar as there is an issue about the gold plating of regulations, this occurs in London rather than Brussels. There are also considerable domestic pressures for regulation from environmental, conservation, animal welfare, public health, and consumer lobbies. Regulations are there for a reason, to protect the environment, farm animals, or human health. Some farmers hope that plant protection products that have been banned under EU regulations could be used after Brexit. However, there will still be domestic pressure to regulate these products, and manufacturers might be unwilling to produce just for the UK market. British farmers benefit to some extent from the political cover that is provided by farm organisations in other member states where agriculture is a higher percentage of GDP or there is a strong cultural attachment to agriculture, as in France. If Brexit becomes a reality, differentiation in agricultural policy and administration across the four territories of the UK can be expected to continue, if not increase. This is also likely to produce debates about level playing fields within the UK. This will especially be the case in agri-environmental issues and rural development. At the moment, Britain conducts international trade negotiations as part of the EU bloc. EU trade agreements with third countries would have to be renegotiated, a process that could take some years to complete. And one difficulty, of course, is that the UK lacks people who have experience of these sorts of negotiations as trade diplomats. UK farmers benefit from the high tariff barriers that the EU has erected against external agricultural products, particularly livestock and dairy products. It is difficult to predict what level of tariff protection the World Trade Organization would permit Britain to maintain outside the EU. Domestic subsidies are also subject to WTO rules, although at a reduced level, these would not be at jeopardy from WTO action. A concern in any WTO negotiations is that protection for farmers could well be traded off against arrangements for manufacturing industry and financial services. This reflects the more general concern that agriculture and food has received insufficient attention in the referendum debate and might well be given a low priority in any post-Brexit negotiations. This could place some farm businesses at risk, leading to diminished food security in the UK. Okay. Many farmers, particularly those in the horticultural and field vegetable sector, are very reliant on migrant labour from elsewhere in the EU. If these farms are to continue to operate, we would need to recreate a version of the soil scheme to assure a supply of migrant labour. Our overall conclusion was that Brexit would not be beneficial to UK agriculture or the food chain more generally. The common agricultural policy is far from being a perfect policy, and it needs to be reformed in a number of ways. Some progress has been made, and these efforts would need to continue if it was decided to remain in the EU. Thank you very much. Quite a lot of food for thought there, a lot of scribbling going on. To my <laughs> uh, we'll talk more about trade and rules and negotiations in a moment. Let's move along the chain a bit. Uh, what about the impact on food security, on food prices, um, on our diets? Although I, I feel as someone who had a bar of chocolate for lunch, I probably should be comment. Um, professor Tim Lang from City University London is Professor of Food Policy. He's a former government commissioner on the Sustainable Development Commission and a former advisor to both the Health and Agriculture Select Committees. Thank you very much. Uh, and thanks to the organisations for organising this. Um, I mean, to pick up on some of the themes that uh, when Grant has raised, um, I mean, agriculture, most of the debate, insofar as there has been a debate in this terrain, has been about farming. And yet the public polls show that about 3% of interest is in agriculture. Three per the public is about 3% of interest compared to, say, migration at the other end, 56, 57% of the population. 
information is concerned about, about that. And when was flagging something, I'll pick up to show you actually the two things, funnily enough, are connected. Um, I'm going to make seven points in my six and a half minutes. The first is, in a sense, the Brexit or Remain question is a complete deviation. Uh, the big picture, the most important thing for uh, the British public, for Europe, indeed for the world, is to make the food chain more sustainable. That is actually what we've got to do, whether in or out, that's the challenge. Climate change, just on its own, is going to transform the food system, not least agriculture. Biodiversity loss, land use, water use, embedded water and food, these are all the really essential ecosystems, infrastructure of food, uh, on which the Brexit versus Remain debate is completely silent, and indeed is almost a deviation. Where it gets more interesting, the Brexit versus Remain debate, uh, also still within sustainability, is the question of culture. What do people want? The length of supply chains, uh, where the money flows, the health impacts, and so on. Uh, consumer choice, where their food comes from. That then begins to enter into the Brexit versus Remain issue. And most, I think 99% of academics now agree the number one concern for the food system is to make it more sustainable. And while the Brexiters have said we want to go it alone, they are completely silent on this. The Remainers are assuming we carry on tentatively, rather inadequately dealing with that. Whereas the evidence says the food system needs to be recalibrated. And that requires multi-level, multi-actor, multi-level uh, 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 engagement, which is where we then enter into the issue is with whom do we have partnerships to sort out that sustainability or not. It is impossible to sort this out on our own. Point two. <coughs> uh, the world is so far being very slow to engage with this big picture, which the academics, the science say is necessary. Diet is the number one cause of premature death on the planet, overtaking tobacco, for example. Uh, culturally, politically, in policy terms, the main driver has been the post-war settlement has been about making food systems more cheap. And here, the image of the CAP has been that food gets more expensive from it. In fact, the figures show right across the board, across all member states, food system, food prices have come down. In Britain, Britain is actually literally at the midway point. I'm drawing in all of this on two papers my colleague Victoria Schoen uh, from the uh, Food Research Collaboration and I, two papers we did, which are over here, one on uh, Brexit versus Remain, the big picture, one on horticulture in particular for reasons I'll say. There has been, at the European level, actually slow but very important engagement with the issues of environment. On health, health is not an EU competence. The EU is not allowed to get engaged in health other than very minor levels of labelling and information and some campaigns to improve public health access uh, and availability of fruit and vegetables. On the consumers, the track record has been heavy engagement because it's about the market, things like labelling. We wouldn't have nutrition labeling. We wouldn't have quid quantitative ingredients declaration systems which labeled the amount of ingredient in a food <coughs> from the greatest to the largest if it wasn't through EU negotiation. Uh, but the UK, at the moment, for the last six years, has actually not been engaging very much, I have to say. Uh, I'm not making a party political point, but when the coalition came in and then under the Conservatives, Actually, the whole question of sustainability and the importance of food has gone down the agenda. The good news is there is currently within the British government a 25 year food plan in working. I think I'm one of the people in this room who has read it. Um, don't hold your breath on it addressing this big issue. The agenda is essentially to export more British food to pay for the imports. And they're right that that's a problem. But this is not exactly a very big engagement with the issue. Point number three, food prices. Essentially, the food system has got incredibly complicated. Out of £198 billion pounds that the British consumers spend on food, farming gets exactly 9.8 or 9.9 .9 billion. Less than 5% of value added goes to farmers. The vast amount of money and value adding is salami sliced everywhere else after the farm. 
And as Wynn said, it wasn't for the CAP, farming basically would go out of business, almost all of it. UK prices are literally in the midpoint. One of the papers Victoria Shona and I brought over here from the FRC, UK's 14th equal out of 21 member states in terms of the relative cheapness of its food. Uh, the issue is who gets the money and where the money goes, and secondly, what sort of food, the quality of food, which brings me on to the fourth point, health and nutrition, that I was asked to address. As I've already said, diet is now the number one cause of premature, of premature death and also of ill health, the Lancet's latest Global Burden of Disease Report, 2014, the methodology developed by the World Bank and the World Health Organization. Uh, on consumer information, I've already said, we get information on nutrition from the EU because of the EU. On environmental information on food, we don't get it. It was written out, actually, at the EU level. On, uh, 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 on environmental information on white goods, on your car, you get a lot of information because of the EU, but you don't get it on food. So there's a deficiency there. Where the nutrition and health becomes actually very important and isn't being talked about at the moment is that food is the biggest employer in Britain. 3.6 million people work in the food system. It's the biggest food manufacturer in Britain. Uh, of the Food and Drink Federation, which is the uh, uh, trade body, 70% voted to go in in their internal polling, <coughs> 90% by value, but they've been silent. I'm actually highly critical of why is the food industry, the retailing industry, the catering industry, and indeed the farming industry silent when this is actually of such fundamental importance. Fifth point, there is a really big issue of the food trade gap. The UK imports £40 billion worth of food. Most of the good things in public health terms, fruit and vegetables, are imported, but we export the things that, let me be very polite, are less than desirable, the alcohols, the biscuits, of sweet, fatty meats, and so on. So the food trade gap of 19 billion pounds, and sorry, 21 billion pounds, and rising, is a health deficit as well as an economic deficit. Sixthly, almost there, uh, uh, the issue of food, of food security. We don't have food stocks. Food stocks are about three to five days. When I was a government commissioner, that was the information we got. When I was a Chatham House uh, report, uh, uh, researcher, we would said it's not, it's three, not five. Uh, the whole Brexit question takes us into astonishing uncertainties about contracts and the futures of supply. Two years minimum, for Article 50, we have to be done and out within two years, and then all the contracts and trade agreements have to be uh, 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 renegotiated. And that's where the issue that we raised about labour becomes so important. We rely upon EU labour food because it's cheap and the labour is cheap. This is not a good situation, let me say, but this is the facts. 27%, all the figures in Victoria's and my briefings, 27% of food manufacturing labour is EU, 28 member uh, uh, state labour. Food service, 28%. Uh, farming in general, 6.4%. Final point, therefore, I think it's risky for the UK to go it alone. Uh, and this is actually the picture that comes out of almost all the academic studies so far. Food is an issue that requires collaboration for the reasons I've said, whether in or out of the EU. The uncertainties about where we go on June the 24th when Article 50 is enacted is absolutely essential to juxtapose with the problems of contracts, and let alone trade negotiations. Are we doing a Norway? Are we doing an Albania? Are we doing a US? Well, we're not doing a US now from Mr. Obama's speeches last week, and so on. Uh, and this is really uh, my last point. Uh, I think the public interest has really got to get its head around this issue that it's food, not farming. We've got to reclaim this issue. I shouldn't say this to you, Charlotte. <laughs> Charlotte was we can be food today. today. Farming <laughs> today presenter shall have hysterics and professional <laughs> food policy is saying, don't think farming, think food. But that is what I think. Okay, um, everybody has mentioned this, Tim and Wynne and President Obama, have all talked about trade agreements. Um, how exactly would international trade laws work then after a Brexit? Um, the one person probably in the country who can answer that is sitting next to me, Professor Fiona Smith from the University of Warwick, a professor of international economic law and a specialist 
in agriculture. Um, thank you very much, Charlotte, and uh, very exciting to, to speak. And um, as Tim said, um, not just talking about food, we need to talk about trade. And a lot has been said so far about uh, the deals that are going to be struck between the UK uh, post-Brexit, and I'm focusing on the Brexit side because that's a more complicated issue. Um, but what's not being said is the impact of the UK's commitments beyond the EU. And these are commitments that the UK voluntarily undertook um, when it joined the World Trade Organization. So at the moment, the EU negotiates trade deals on behalf of the UK. But the UK is also in its own right a member of the WTO. And there's real questions about what will happen um, when the, um, if, on the 24th, the UK decides um, to withdraw from the EU. And I, I see there's, there's about um, a bit like two, four things that, that I want to, to talk about um, anyway. The first thing to say is that the, Euro the United Kingdom will be bound by all World Trade Organization rules after exit, um, <coughs> as it is before exit. That situation will not change. The difference is, is how the UK goes about um, uh, negotiating its way to a um, post, um, to a Brexit um, position. So the first thing, um, just to pick up on some of the issues that um, Tim and uh, Wynne raised, the first thing is the issue of food safety, labelling, food standards. And I think this is a very important issue to think about. Um, the complexity of the food chain now and where exactly we source our food. So the WTO rules actually impact on trade in food and tra how we trace food um, through the various aspects of the food chain. Now the EU has been responsible for many of the tracing um, issues and they've been implemented into the UK. But the UK will still um, probably be interested in keeping some form of tracing issues. Now, the WTO requires the UK to comply with various um, measures, so it's not going to be able to just implement any food tracing measure or any food safety measure. Any measure that it imposes has to um, not discriminate between the other 161 members of the WTO. So they've got to be non-discriminatory. So we can't target areas of the EU that we regard as particularly onerous um, and say that's where the food's coming from, we really don't like that, so we need more onerous measures. We won't be able to do that. Um, the other thing um, is we can't dress our food safety uh, measures up as uh, um, just as food safety measures if the WTO regards them as trade restrictions. If they look like a barrier to, to trade, free trade in food, whatever that um, product looks like. Um, again, the WTO um, rules, particularly in the sanitary and phytosanitary agreement, for those of you who want some more detail, uh, they will actually impact. And again, every measure that we uh, introduce on food safety labelling standards has to be run past a risk assessment and be based on sound science. So our, our area of manoeuvre is restricted. Any labelling we want to put on products of our air miles, content of food, again, the WTO will um, impact on that. So the situation, uh, whether it's Remain or Brexit, the situation in, remain, in relation to labelling and the hygiene standards on food, animal welfare, will remain the same um, if the, the UK implements the same sort of rules um, and that it has now. So be, I, I think very little change there, um, given the drive and, um, by consumers particularly and interest in uh, the safety of our food and our animals. The second point I want to make um, is more in relation to agriculture and um, I take Tim's point but uh, I'm afraid that agriculture is going to be where the exciting times come. The WTO sets limits, maximum limits, on the amount of import tariffs, on the amount of domestic subsidies and the amount of export subsidies that a WTO member can have. Um, there's complex systems that I'll, um, rules that I'll spare you with, but essentially they're limits. Now they're currently being renegotiated and the WTO is um, trying to work towards um, removal of all export subsidies 
with immediate effect. There's a specific carve out for dairy products, swine meat and processed products, but that's only available if it was already notified to the WTO that um, a country wants to take advantage of that. Now, this is pre-notified prior to 2015. Now, the UK is not going to be able to take advantage of that carve-out and retain its export subsidies. And the reason is, is because the EU negotiates all trade deals on the UK's behalf. It's part of the, um, the way that the EU works in the WTO. So, as the UK will effectively be operating in the WTO independently after the 24th of June 2016, that's after the carve-out. So, we'll be looking at um, zero uh, export subsidies. Um, that's where the deals go. Slightly more tricky is the way that the rules um, work in agriculture um, policy and I'll try and make this as straightforward as I can. So in addition to the limits, once the limits have been set, those limits are put in what's called a schedule. So it's a list of all the commitments on tariffs and subsidies that a country agrees to abide by. The problem is there is a single EU schedule for agriculture um, in the WTO, it's just one. And that schedule covers all um, of the EU members, irrespective. It's not carved out separately. And the EU then decides how much money to allocate down. So after Brexit, if it happens on the 24th of June, there will be four possible options as what's going to happen to that schedule. The first option is the UK doesn't have any commitments at all. So it has a completely empty schedule. Now, if this happens, the UK will be treated as if it's a new member of the WTO, and it may have to negotiate with all 161 other members of the WTO um, exactly what the deal is on agriculture in relation to its tariffs and its subsidies, its export subsidies, and its, um, and its domestic subsidies, which clearly is a major undertaking. It's great for me as a trade lawyer, but um, it's, uh, it's going to be a huge undertaking. The problem with being treated as a new member of the WTO is the other members may require greater um, commitments than actually the WTO rules require. So for example, when China rejoined the WTO, um, it was required to eliminate all its export subsidies overnight, even though that's not actually a requirement of the WTO rules. So you can actually get pushed into greater commitments. So that's, so that's if the UK is treated as if. Um, it was um, a new member. I think it's highly unlikely, so we've got some other options. Um, the, U the UK might just take over some of the EU's um, tariff bindings, and this happened when the Czech and Slovak republics separated back in 93, and that was easy because they just used an existing schedule that Czechoslovakia had, and nobody was really worried about it. But I think they will be worried about um, the UK, so, so that's probably not going to be allowed. Um, and then, so then we're into the renegotiation of who gets what, and that will happen with the, within the EU. So the UK and the EU are going to have to negotiate exactly what, um, their, how to carve out their commitments. The difficulty with that is it's not just up to the UK and the EU to negotiate that. So even if they can come up with a deal, that deal then has to be agreed by the other 161 members, um, minus the EU members, um, it has to be agreed by them. And if they don't agree it, or there's an issue with it, there's a question, as yet uncertain, whether the UK and the EU would have to pay some form of compensation in relation to tariffs concessions. Now that, that question is really up in the air because the WTO doesn't, doesn't actually technically have any provisions on withdrawal from a customs union like this. So there's real issues there. Um, but smart money is on that um, there will be concessions. And one last thing, um, well, one, one last point. Um, we've been talking a lot about Norway uh, as an option. Norway uh, has, has a free trade area agreement with um, the EU, as you know, and the Swiss option. Um, again, any free trade area like this um, can't just be agreed, it has to be run through the WTO rules. And those rules are quite clear that if as a result of the negotiation another member feels that their, their relationship, their trade relationship is effective and the, the rules are quite technical on this, then again there will be compensation payable in the form.
on the tariff concessions. So there's a lot of complexity and a lot of uncertainty, um, but, but definitely it's not just down to the UK and the EU to work it out. There will be this external influence from the WTO. So it's pretty clear that trade lawyers are hoping for one particular result, I would think, <laughs> at this point. Um, thank you all very much indeed. Um, we seem to have lost an MP somewhere. Oh, he's at a, a, in a Westminster Hall debate and is somewhat stuck. Um, so um, I'm sure we can manage that. Uh, let me introduce our MPs. We have Kerry McCarthy with us, uh, Labour MP for Bristol East, and also the Shadow DEFRA Secretary. And um, sitting next to me, Ray Finch, who is um, an MEP for UKIP for the South of England. Um, Kerry, would you like to kick off and uh, cross-question our experts? Okay, um, I suppose my, my starting point to win would be, um, you talked about um, how subsidies are seen as market distorting, um, but then you said that Pillar 2, you thought there would be less of a problem um, in terms of those subsidies being re retained in the event of Brexit. But the UK government was actually quite keen to keep Pillar 2 down you know, to 12.5% rather than the 15 Is everybody clear about Pillar Sorry. 1 and Pillar 2? I know that not all of us find this fascinating. Um, in, very, in very broad terms, Pillar 1 is the subsidy that is paid direct to farmers, and Pillar 2 is the money that goes for projects to either improve the environment or rural development. I'm sorry. So, so on the one hand, I would say um, in terms of you saying, and I agree with you actually, that the UK government would be unlikely to pick up the same level of subsidies, but because they don't like that market interference ideologically. But this, on, on the one hand, you said that the environmentalists wouldn't allow them to um, water down Pillar 2, but wouldn't the same apply in terms of the subsidies and the farming lobby in respect of Pillar 1? So why, why do you see them as, as Pillar 2 as being safer when I think ideologically the government isn't very keen on either of them? Shall I answer yeah, that? Sorry, that's a bit, a bit <laughs> of a wordy way of putting it, but I got there in the end. Yes, I mean, obviously the, the farming lobby would um, seek to resist a, a reduction in subsidies, mm -hmm. and no doubt they would have, you know, there would be a, a controversy. I mean, in an ideal situation, what one would do if one was outside the EU is try and rethink what the objectives of the subsidies were and then what sort of policy instruments one wanted to have to um, secure those objectives. But of course, I mean, I think the point about the Pillar 2 subsidies is that, I mean, certainly in academic terms, they have a stronger justification because they're concerned with the provision of certain kinds of public goods in protection of the environment and so on. I mean, I think their coverage is inadequate because I mean, as Tim referred to climate change, one of the problems, I think, is, is there isn't a policy on climate change. Really. When we had the last reform process, um, there was talk of having a pillar specifically on climate change, but that disappeared pretty quickly in the discussion. So the, the coverage of Pillar 2 um, is not ideal, but I think um, what would happen there is you, you would get the environment lobbies conservation lobbies, rural development lobbies, and the farmers all on the same side. So there would be a very powerful coalition um, pressing for this. Um, and Pillar 1 it would just really be the farmers who were pressing for this primarily. And that could be presented as something that was rather self-interested, even though there might be arguments for doing it in terms of food security and so on. Just taking on your questions. Uh, do you really and truly believe the farmers have no influence? I mean, we know in, in the European Parliament, we, we look upon the NFU as the English or British equivalent to the NRA. You simply do not mess with the NFU. There is no... Our, our, our perspective and our understanding from all of our dealings is that no British government would be prepared to cut any subsidies. And I can't think of any any political party, major political party uh, in the UK who, who would be willing to risk that. that uh, our, our impression is they would be out on the air within six months. You, you simply do not mess with the farming lobby. Could you agree? Well, I think it's certainly true in Europe that the NFU has a, a sophisticated operation in Brussels. And of course, the thing about the European Parliament is if you look at the Agriculture Committee, it is uh, overwhelmingly represented of various kinds of farming interests. And since we've had uh, 
what was originally called co-decision, the weight of those interests in the decision-making process in Europe has increased. I, I still think that um, given the pressures on public expenditure, which are likely to continue, the Treasury is always looking for savings, and it's looking for savings in areas that the market distorting. Now, I think you know, the farming lobby will probably be able to restrict the rate and level of reduction, but I don't think they will be able to stop that reduction in, in blanket subsidies altogether, which in any case are a rather inefficient means of um, achieving the kinds of objectives one might have in agricultural policy. Can I just add a point to that? I was interested um, in, on the Today programme last week, Mr Gove, Michael Gove, actually implied that he was prepared to take it up, take up the farms, because he said how Brexit would be very good for Africa and development, because it would be a source of much cheaper food and to undercut existing European food. I thought that was Brexit kind of breaking ranks for the first time, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's what he said. It? No. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure he, he did say it. But well, Mr. Gold's got a, a reputation anyway for putting his head in the noose. But um, the fact is, what one of the real problems we have with, with EU tariff barriers is things like coffee from Africa. Uh, unprocessed coffee from Africa, there's no tariff on it. Processed, and the same goes for cocoa. Processed, there's huge tariffs on it, and that, and that actually causes a lot of development in Africa and helps keep African nations poor. I think if he, if he was saying anything of the sort, and, and obviously I, I believe you, you said what you said, uh, then, then I think that's what he means. It wouldn't be specifically goods that are grown or produced in the UK. I think it, possibly what he meant to say, and I'm not Michael Gove's uh, agent, but uh, possibly what he meant to say was that if, if we would be able to open up those uh, previously uh, heavily tariffed goods uh, for the good of everyone. I think that is exactly what he meant. Um, there is but that wouldn't pre place any pressure on, on UK farmers? No, it's just a rerun of 1846, if you know your history. Uh, that's exactly what the repeal of the Corn Laws was about by 1880s. This is Wind's territory, and I know only too well that by the 1880s British farming was in decline and was down to about 30% of production by 1914-16, tottered up a bit, and then it was when in 1939, Alan, looking over there, it was about uh, it was about 30% again. It wasn't until the end of the war, 1945, the production was 60% of, of, of self-sufficiency. It's currently, by the way, I just looked up the figures. It's 54%. So, I mean, I presume that Mr. Gove wanted to have more soft imperialism, having Africa and cheap land and labour providing more, and what was he going to do to the land in Britain? I don't know. As, he, he, isn't here? as he isn't here, and I, <laughs> I think we would all hesitate to speak. He's the leader of the Brexit. Um, <laughs> so I'm just, just one thing I wanted to, to ask you talked about at, at the end, when about um, don't Brexit, instead reform cap. I think in my professional life I've now been through two cap reforms, um, which are long processes to put in margin. How, how, yeah, quite, uh, how <coughs> realistic, how much appetite is there in Europe for more reform, meaningful reform? Well, I, mean, I think that is an issue, and um, I, I mean I think we have made progress. I mean through these these reforms, the very distorting policy instruments like intervention and purchasing have largely disappeared. Um, so progress has been made in that respect. And I think there are people in Europe who recognise that we need to address this wider sustainability agenda which Tim referred to, that we, you know, that we really need a common agricultural and food policy which concerns itself with these broader issues of diet, uh, nutrition and <coughs> environmental impact. So I think there is some support for that. But of course obviously building a political coalition for that uh, is clearly not straightforward or easy. I would recognise that. Do you think, having voted to remain, if that's what we do, there will, there, Britain might have more or less political clout at that point? It could have more political clout if it plays its cards in the right way and if it engages with Europe in a more systematic and effective way than it has in the past. I think if it, if it does that, then it could have more political clout. But, but on that point, 
that, that's assuming that the, the UK has that agenda and the political will to pursue that agenda. Yeah. And I don't think that that's where, it's certainly not where DEFRA is at the moment, as we've said with the 25-year food and farming plan, which is basically an export plan. Yeah. So, uh, sort of, and, and I would actually say that's an argument for remaining in, because um, left to our own devices, I don't think we would be pursuing those issues, whereas perhaps there are other forces within the EU at the moment that might be more likely to um, push those issues. I don't know. Yeah, I, 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 I would agree with that, and of course, but of course there's, well, it's got to look at the longer run, there's always the possibility you know, that some future administration might have a different set of priorities. Yeah, that's what one, one would hope. I agree with them, absolutely. I mean, the, the point of, I think, all three of us is that there's a very complex agenda to address about Europe and food, or food, whether one's in Europe or not. Uh, uh, but the issue is that it's got to be done through some sort of cooperation. So why box yourself into a corner? Whereas Vienna was elegantly showing, you know, the complexity of coming out is just astonishing. That is not to say you haven't heard any of us three let alone any of the other academics in the room, let alone the wider constituency of academics working on food and agriculture and Europe, that we think somehow we're in nirvana at the present. We're not. But at least there are some processes for dealing. I mean, you know, the I spent half of last week with two out of the six chapter headers on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And they are absolutely clear that we have to be moving very fast indeed uh, and, you know, it's, we're, we're already well on to two degrees climate change. And it's food which is the greatest impact that that has. So at the very moment when we need to be uh, addressing that sort of huge picture and need to be getting our own house into order, which it isn't at the moment. The British food system is over-carbonised, over-watered, uh, and uh, destructive in a hidden way about biodiversity. You know, and we now know that, we've got very good evidence base about that, uh, we really should be addressing that. And that's, that's your area, not our area. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just confused as to why you believe that being in the European Union, in a common agricultural policy that was introduced 54 years ago, that is still always being reformed and never seems to work, is better for, for, for world food production than the UK <coughs> becoming independent and, and being able to deal as the fifth largest in terms of GDP nation in the world uh, as being one of the leaders to help world food production. I, 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 I simply don't get the connection. The European Union, in my, in my experience, has always been essentially a customs union that is only interested in its own prosperity. It's when, when I was involved with the Labour Party many years ago, we used to call it the Bosses Union, and it was then and it is now. So why is it so great if it's so rubbish? <laughs> <laughs> That's a, a very sharp sort of summary, uh, and, and very good. Um, yeah, no, I think that's a very good argument. There, there aren't many of us who see things in the sort of nuanced way. We don't have some sympathy to that, actually. But we know it's a very messy situation. This is not everything's good in and uh, bad out, or any more than it is uh, good out and, and bad in. It's a, a messier and patchier world, I think. Um, the issue is whether any country on its own can sort out the food system. But that's why I was raising Mr. Gove's statement, because this is really, really important. This is the first statement from any of the Brexit camps of saying really what they'd like to happen. Uh, other than your own party has actually had a, a clear agricultural position which, for which you deserve credit. The others have kept their heads down on this. Uh, so I, I'm actually, I, I think that the question is a good one. But ultimately, I don't know what wins or Fiona's argument or our colleagues in the audience, uh, I think we're in a multi-state world. Food is about water, air, and land. Or we have control, a little bit of control over our land, um, but we don't over the things that affect that land. They go beyond borders. And in a world where food crosses borders, 
you might as well negotiate with the people who shape it crossing the borders. That, it just seems to me, is the basic politics. Can't you um, do that from without as well as from within? Well, not because you get, for precisely the reasons that Fiona said so elegantly, it, it, it is a quagmire. I mean, this is me being shocked. It's a quagmire. This is not simple. It ain't going to be done in two years. No. I, I this don't is think a anyone, mess. anyone sane would believe that uh, the UK's disentanglement from the EU and, as, as regards governments by the EU will happen within two years. There is obviously, uh, you know, know there is you. obviously going to be a longer term uh, perspective over these things. Mr Finch, listen to what I said. I'm not going to start hitting the table. Oh, good. Like the, you know, as long as it's just the time. Stocks, stocks are three to five. We are in a just-in-time food system. Stocks are three days max. Let's just be very clear. On June the twenty-fourth, we start coming out. On June the twenty-eighth, do we run out of food? No. Could I call that? No, 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 <laughs> no. The contracts have to start being worked out very, very carefully. It's about contracting. This is about the m millions of contracts that are made for the import and export of food. I think I should the lawyer should leave. Yes, <laughs> I think that, yeah, the lawyer speaks. <coughs> the the other thing that um, I think is is worth noting is that if, um, as Tim said, we've got such a short time um, to renegotiate the contracts, and I'm about to his expertise on, on that. Um, Usually three months. Then I, if three we have three months, but... um, then one thing that can happen, um, and it, it's a matter of international law rather than trade law, <coughs> is that any um, farmers or food processors or people who have a contract that's based on expectations under EU law that's derived from the EU treaty, they'd have what we refer to in law as vested rights. In other words, those rights would continue as a matter of international law, irrespective of whether we went out or not. Mm. So, and that could be for quite a long time. Um, so that would be irrespective. So we're not going to start by the end of June? We might, we might. But then the question is, we're well, not if, really all the, if all the law stays the same and the status quo just carries on, why might we? Well, no, because one, the the issue, one, of the, one of the great complexities is that that's the issue of vested rights, which says that any international treaty, even if it's stopped, the rights continue, and that's could be the, the contract rights. But um, on the other side, um, there is another argument that the other branch of law says, which is any EU regulation that was um, actually brought into being as a result of the European Communities Act, which is the piece of legislation we have to implement all the a lot of EU rules. As soon as that falls away, all the secondary legislation falls away, and maybe any contractual rights fall away as well. So the lawyers can't agree either. So there's going to be a lot of complexity. So while we sort it out, that deadline will stop. However, sorry, no, no, no. The, the, the fact remains that once Article 50 is, uh, is started, the process for Article 50, we still stay as a member, as a full member of the European Union. For two years. Honestly, I, I cannot conceive, uh, uh, maybe I'm just not being imaginative enough, that anyone would think that contracts would become invalid whilst we're still a member of the European Union. Uh, it, it's. I hesitate why, to why use the word scaremongering. Why does the entire British food industry, manufacturing industry want to stay in there? Why do the food retailers want to stay in? Is, is, is there, I mean, there's, there's also a difference between what happens according to the, the rules on the contracts and legalities and what actually happens in the market. Yes. So in terms of food futures, for example, and just the, the general market reaction to a vote for Brexit and what impact that would have on our, our farmers, you know, who, who are, as, as well, you know, the, the inputs into to farming as well as their... Their exports. The the major, there's a great deal of uncertainty around that. The major factor I, I probably should have said in the, the issue of food prices, almost all the economists have raised the issue, this is about the price of the pound, mm. the value of the pound. Mm. The pound goes down, you know, the city is saying it will go down. Mm. Who knows? The city is being sold. Oh, yeah. uh, yeah. Is that going to be the issue? I don't know. Alan Swinbank's in 
he's keeping his head down. He's keeping his head down. We looked at the papers. One of which was his. Yeah, I've actually been reading your very interesting document there. And and you talk about food import costs will rise if the price of sterling falls. You know what? What if it rises? If, uh, the well, fact is, a lot, a lot of, a lot of what people are saying, oh, you know, the the, the ceiling's going to fall down on us. Uh, any of the issues by now would have been priced in into the market, or, or very <coughs> soon they will have been. So, you know, it's. If it's bad, it can be bad. If it's good, it can be good. But, but if, you, if you, you cannot possibly it. say, <coughs> you cannot possibly say, in this that if if food food import costs will rise if the price of sterling falls, without saying also, you know, food import costs will fall if the price. I haven't, of I haven't rise. read any city prognosis mm. that has said anything about sterling going up. Indeed, the Treasury paper. I, I can interview Monday you. last week. I can interview you. Well. Because, because I mean, if you're, if you're a farmer you. that is teetering on the brink as it is, and you know the farmers that had their farm payments delayed, for example, it really was touch and go as to whether they survive. Would you want to take the risk of sort of basically betting on whether the currency is going to rise? Or would or you or? want to take the risk of being in somewhere where where your food, uh, where your subsidies don't always turn up on time? If it's all before you go, what? Do you think the UK well, government I, will deliver subsidies any better? <laughs> why not? Because they could get their system, that's, that's their computer system can't, at the moment. You can't vote the EU else. It's, it's the death of run computer okay, system at the moment, isn't it? That's fake. Let's pause that there. I'm making plans personally to re retrain as a trade lawyer. Um, <laughs> in the meantime, um, let's open it up to the audience. Um, retrain as a horticulturist. Uh, <laughs> if. Oh, yeah, sorry, but I hid it. Sorry, there you go. A microphone will make its way towards you if you, if you wave like mad. If you're from a particular organisation, if you tell us who you are and where you're from, and if you're aiming your question or your comment at anyone in particular, then please make that clear to us. Uh, right, so, hands up. Who wants to be first? Don't be shy. Oh, thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Rowell from Chatham House. Um, I just wanted to see if we could get some more positive comments about opportunities for EU policy making to support sustainable food systems and sustainable diets. We, I mean, aside from whether or not we should leave, if we were to stay in, what future do you see for a positive EU strategy on uh, fostering a more sustainable food system? Uh, well, very quickly, I nearly said it as an addendum to something Wynne said. There is, a, I mean, you know, Lord, for goodness sake, uh, as well, this is almost a rhetorical question, should I say, that the, um, the groundswell across Europe, uh, across civil society and, and science and academia, and in and sections of the parliament, actually, to shift the cap to a system common sustainable food policy, what Wynne was referring I think is building up. If there is going to be any change, that will be the direction it goes. And there is a political agenda building in the way that it always does at the European level to do exactly that. Because really, climate change, climate change is the one thing the politicians have got. You know only too well. Where it gets tricky, and where the EU ducked it last time, the Juncker Commission, when it came in, Act Number Four of Mr. Juncker's commission was to stop the Sustainable Food Committee, which was in draft. But the circular economy uh, directive and think, sorry, communicate and thinking is having not quite that effect, but is certainly already beginning to have that engagement. Transforming the waste, transforming um, uh, the, 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 the flow of carbon down the system. Whether one calls that sustainable food policy or, or not, I think is a moot point. But I think the drift of history is towards that. I don't know what yeah. <clears throat> I mean, the, the only problem, I think, is if you're specifically thinking about climate change, why was this proposal for a climate change pillar knocked on the head? Well, I haven't systematically researched this, but I suspect what happened was that it was opposed by agribusiness interests, that the, you know, the providers of farm equipment, which is very fossil fuel intensive, uh, 
providers of agrochemicals and so on opposed this uh, move as contrary to our interests, not so much opposition coming from farmers. So there's always that political battle uh, to be fought out. I think. But I think it was a huge, I agree with that, it was that. Um, but it, it, it was, the, the, there is a counter trend within agribusiness. Some of the very big food companies are now deeply <coughs> worried. Uh, and so I think there's a very interesting split. It's not like it's farmers versus manufacturers versus retailers. There are splits within those sectors that are politically very, very interesting. So I think all of that is, uh, I mean, I think if Mr. Finch is still elected, I would expect you to be running with this in, in the next three years. I think, um, just to add to all of that, um, I, um, I mean, what I can see is there's a, a greater convergence between climate policies and uh, food policies and also trade yeah. policies. We're seeing that a lot more. So the sort of frameworks in the Paris um, Treaty uh, on climate change very, very reminiscent of a lot of stuff that you find in trade treaties that have been very effective. So I think there's a lot coming yeah. together there. But I think one of the difficulties of developing the cap any further towards a sustainable agenda is the fact that there's, it depends on the policy instruments that you want to use in the cap. You know, do you still want to use subsidies um, for, for, farm, for agriculture production? Because one of the difficulties is if you give farmers um, subsidies, you can't give them, you, you've got to be very careful how you target them for environmental reasons because they can't really have an effect on production. Um, so it's very, very difficult to get the targeting right. And um, when the EU reformed the agricultural policy in this last 2013 reform, they had these greeting sort of um, requirements on top of the direct payment. And that, um, well, um, I wrote that it wasn't compatible with WTO agreements, and others agreed with me, but the jury's still out of it because the EU is claiming that they are. So that there is a, 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 a definitely a, an interest in moving that way, but that, again, there's this exterior constraint of the WTO that, that makes it tricky. Can I just slightly twist Laura's question and say, what about the opportunities for policy making on this sustainable aim, if you like, if you break it? Well, I mean, that, that would be the argument for Brexit. That's what I'd like Mr Finch to argue. Uh, but I don't hear anyone in the Brexit camp argue that. They basically said they just don't want Brussels, as opposed to they do want sustainability. I think the whole sustainability agenda on food is for the taking, actually. That's why I'm you know, actually irritated by the food industry for not putting its head above the parapet when its own members wanted to do so. When just on practical basis, mm. could could you do it just as the UK? Well, you could do it. I mean, obviously, it wouldn't have the same kind of impact, if you're thinking about climate change in particular, as a policy that was in force across the European Union. It would just be a, a policy that was in force in one former member state, but you could, in principle, you could do it. I mean, it would depend on the attitude of the UK government and what they thought about it. Um, just as a, another innovation, policy innovation, the other thing you could start thinking about is investment. So if you can't supply it, um, the food within the UK and would depend on a very complex food chain, the other thing you can do is start um, encouraging companies to invest in other places and make um, investment, um, and return to the investment, maybe a growth in crops elsewhere and bring them back to the UK, you could do it like that, but that's not um, ideal either. I think whether that would be sustainable. Mm -hmm. way of making the food chain system. Mm -hmm. well, well, one of the, and, and I'll go to my particular uh, specialisation, one of the issues we really do have with the EU is with fisheries, with the state nation agreements. If, if you see what's happening to, to particularly African nations, essentially what happens is the EU takes a big bag of EU taxpayers' cash, hands it to an African government and says, right, we're going to take your fish now. And what happens is all of these huge, absolutely huge factory ships come in, they wipe the African seas clean, and the people who are there, the subsistence fishermen, the artisanals, they then have a choice. They either starve, or they go into piracy, or they go into people smuggling, or they migrate. You know, we we need we need one of the things we need to sort out, or, or the EU needs to sort out be, before anything else, before it goes around telling anyone else how to live its life, is is to stop getting involved in these things, which 
which is essentially neo-colonialism. It's uh, wait, I, I often get this, you know, this thing about the EU being all lovely and, and in the vanguard of of uh, of world peace and, and general loveliness, fluffy bunniness, and then you see what it's doing there. And it isn't the only it isn't the only uh, mega state that's doing it. But however, you know, frankly, China and Russia make no claims to be to be fluffy and cuddly. So, just to bring us back to this, this the idea of having a sustainable food system. Yeah. So if, if we break it, yeah. Would would there be an appetite, do you think, here to change things in that way? I certainly think so. I I, I think the the UK has some incredibly powerful uh, NGOs. Based, based in the UK, or mainly based in the UK, who do influence our government policy. You know, much much more so, I think, than the EU, because they this tend to be... Oops. <laughs> 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 very good. It was very good. They, 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 they do tend to be rather powerful for, as regards the British government, and they can... They, they can actually cause huge problems for government, particularly all the sorts of 38 degrees... Uh, uh, attacks, they really do. Well, I think you should, on the one hand, we, I, th I think the way food and farming is moving is, is in two different directions, and one is very much taking on board the need to be more sustainable, moving towards um, yeah, more environment, yeah, an, an agriculture that's more in touch with the environment, and then also a lot of food products that you'll see the growth, you know, um, of, of if, if you like, the, the sort of healthier eating, the um, almost like fundamentalist healthy eating side of things. And then on the other hand, you've got the move towards intensive farming, industrialisation, the race for cheaper and cheaper food. And um, coupled with that, people eating far more processed fast food, cheap food. And um, so, so you've got that, that divergence. And one of them, I think particularly, you know, the, they're both, they're both to an extent driven by the public rather than by politicians. But I don't think we've ever sort of had been able to fill in that gap. And as, you know, with, with DEFRA, for example, um, the Food and Farming Plan would have been an ideal way to try to bridge that gap and look at how we can, um, rather than the... My, my concern is that the people that are doing the right thing aren't reaching out into the, the sort of broader demographic. And it is very, it, it's quite an elitist way of life at the moment, so the people with the new tree blend or whatever. And it's, it's, it's how do you cross that, and particularly you know, as a Bristol MP, we see that all the time, how do you bridge that divide? And I'm just not, I don't see the, the sort of political will, I don't see the will from the majority of the food companies or the farming industry who are chasing, you know, trying to keep their heads above water and therefore trying to produce more and sell more to compensate for the fact that they can get so little for their produce. I don't see that happening within the UK, and perhaps if you were to give them the reassurance that if you were within the EU and there would be a level playing field and everyone would be doing the same thing, so there would be a market that you could sell things to, then perhaps they'd be more likely to do it. But, but I, I think left to their own under, devices, I just see it carrying on. That's why they're under such attack yeah. from the public health world. Mm. Hold that thought. Let's take some questions. Uh, back, then. Go back and then raise it. Um, I'm Kira Box and I am a campaigner on food for Friends of the Earth. Uh, we're one of those hugely influential NGOs who've been campaigning on food for uh, the last 20 years plus, and as you can see, we have a hugely sustainable food system already. <laughs> um, I suppose two points. One is Given uh, kind of rumblings around the EU circular economy package and the removal of the food waste target being down to some pretty heavy lobbying that came from the UK, um, and also given recent moves here to try and roll back the, the poultry welfare regulations so that those were voluntary rather than um, part of legislation, um, I just kind of wonder, coming away from camp, what the panel feel that the UK might do in terms of animal welfare, in terms of food waste and those other issues, were there to be a Brexit. And I suppose the second question, just on um, Laura's more positive point, would be if we did not Brexit, given, I think someone mentioned earlier, the, um, 
the fact that the EU does get involved in, in public health issues, what could be the, the potential for a remain public health in terms of public health being a sustainable diet for public health? Uh, what could be the potential for that at an EU level? Kick yeah. off, let's, let's first look at out, given where we are and what we're doing, what would be our likely direction of travel? I mean, of course, I mean, in relation, I mean, the UK has been uh, particularly strong organisations in relation to animal welfare, and there's a very strong resistance to the recent government proposals to make um, changes in that area, and I think the UK has been a very active pursuer of um, stronger animal welfare within the European Union. If we were outside the European Union, then I think uh, those pressures would remain within the UK for high animal welfare standards. I think that some of the influence that the UK has had on the debate in the European Union would, um, would then be lost, and that debate would lose some of the momentum that it's had, partly as a consequence of pressures coming from the UK. I think Kira kind of sort of implied the answer to her question again, and I'm in great sympathy with that. Uh, I, I don't think we've got uh, enough pressure for a pretty dramatic shift towards sustainability, either at production end or consumption. Actually, the EU, for the reasons that Wynne was uh, saying, has been more effective at trying to uh, contain the world's excesses of farming and damage on the environment. It's been a very effective uh, uh, sort of means for doing it. The problem has been, if I understood uh, Kira's question, or the, the thrust of it, the problem is I think Britain hasn't been a good European. And we've underplayed our position. And precisely as Mr. Finch said, we are a very powerful economy. We're a a very dependent food economy. And we have some of Europe's, indeed the world's biggest food companies. And we underplay <coughs> our position, actually. We take a very defensive, hands up position. Well, I think, I th I think it, the difficulty in answering your question is whether you conflate the current government with the UK position. So at the moment, as you say, the, with the circular economy, strategy, it was the UK that were arguing against targets, wanted food waste removed from that. You've got the, the ban on neonics, uh, the similar position, and then with the, the, there's a general um, inclination towards deregulation um, and leaving things to the market and advocating the benefits of voluntary approach. So with my food waste bill, I kept being told, well, you know, there's really, there are some excellent initiatives in the voluntary sector, and the supermarkets are moving in the right direction, but it's whether you, it's, it, you know, it, it's whether you believe that that is good enough or whether you think if the government got involved you'd do things much more quickly. So it's a bit difficult to say that is how the UK would behave 10 years down the line because it could be a different government that would have a very different view. What I think is true though is, you know, one of the things I'm concerned about is I will have farmers telling me that they feel the burden of EU regulation on things like um, animal welfare standards but at the same time they're very proud of the fact that they say we have better animal welfare standards than other countries and you can't really argue both one is you know are, are we going to say that we will benefit from being outside the EU because we won't have to meet those standards or are we um, arguing you know that we're better than them therefore we shouldn't be in there and um, I personally think you know the bigger the market you can have endearing uh, sort of adhering to good animal welfare standards and lifting the others up Surely that's something that we'd want to achieve. Right. Yeah, a um, couple of things. Uh, battery chickens. We still have, a, and I'm not our farming uh, spokesman, but our, our actual farm spokesman is a poultry farmer in Norfolk. Uh, and he tells me that Eastern Europe, in Eastern Europe, that the condition in which, in, in which poultry are kept it, it, it is so far below ours is to be untrue and, and there's nothing being done about it uh, so and, and we have fairly high standards on it obviously it can always be better obviously also live exports uh, my party and i don't want to be part of political about it we've always been against live animal exports we we, we think it's it's unnecessarily uh, damaging uh, and the third one is ttip what happens with ttip what happens there with food standards 
depends what tea table is. <laughs> well, if you want to go and sit in, in a small, very small room with, with no recording equipment and read the one, uh, the one document that we've got on it, yeah. And, and not be able to tell anyone about yeah. it when you get out, then you can find out. Yeah. <laughs> let's just, <laughs> enticing as that invitation is, yeah. um, <laughs> let's just leave that there. We've suddenly got a flurry of questions, so I'm going to leave the second part of your question, Laura, with apologies. If we hear from Rosie, and I'm going to get to the back. Rosie probably got from the London Food Board. Um, actually, one of my questions was, what's the implication for TTIP, whether we're in or out, because it has some serious effects on the food system. The other question of incredible ignorance in terms of our food labelling, I'm not sure how much of it comes from Europe, how much of it comes from here, and what on earth would happen to it if on the 24th we're out of Europe. What system do we follow? Who do we look at? Yeah, no, let's start with the label. So 24th, what's going on? On the 24th, um, if on, well, on the 24th, um, I think it, it hopefully will be sort of business as usual, because yeah, in, terms, in terms of um, the only time we start to worry from a legal point of view, is the point at which the UK repeals the European Community Act because a lot of the, the labelling and the health, um, the, the sort of the regulation we're talking about, uh, a lot of it's in secondary legislation that's dependent for its existence on that, that act. So the point at which that goes um, is the point at which uh, things get slightly um, concerning. Um, I think just in terms of the labelling side of things, um, the requirement would be that it was non-discriminatory. I mean, that we could, we could impose new regulations of that kind, new, new laws of that kind, but it wouldn't be, you couldn't have it in discriminatory, that would be the issue. In WTO terms. In WTO terms, yes, certainly. Um, uh, just talking about, do you want to talk about TTIP? Yes, please. Yes, yes please. Briefly, <laughs> <laughs> if you can. Yeah, briefly. Um, okay, <laughs> just, just very quickly on TTIP, um, if, uh, after, if Brexit happens, um, the UK will no, be no longer a member of the EU, so technically speaking, TTIP will become irrelevant to the UK. Um, it is a, an agreement between the US and the, UK, um, and the EU as it is, it is constituted. As, as it is constituted. Um, so we don't need to worry about it um, if, if Brexit happens in terms of that side of things. But I suppose there's a classic um, argument put the other way, which is if we're not a part of it, uh, then we'll probably be affected by it. Um, so um, in terms of agriculture, yes, we're talking about food standards. There is a, there is an, a disagreement between the US and the EU in relation to what food standards are. The, the EU obviously has a much uh, less um, a lower tolerance than the US does for things like um, antibiotics in um, beef, animal production, etc. Et um, one thing I would just say is that um, even if um, TTIP goes ahead, um, again, you still be subject to WTO rules, so you're not going to have very, very high standards in relation to antibiotics anyway if it becomes a trade restriction. Um, and what about the, things like chlorine washed chicken, GMOs, that sort of stuff? That to just in terms of what? what that we mean? might be forced to accept, and if we refuse it, it would be seen as a barrier to trade. In terms of? Well, things that at the moment mean? we don't accept right. would be forced upon us. What, would, what is our arguing basis or legal basis? What then? for getting rid of TETA? Well, getting rid of certain elephants. Of it. If we've if we've come out, you mean? No, no. If we're in. if we're in. So if if we're inside if we're inside the if we remain in the EU and TTIP happens, is that right? Okay, and then with it, then our redress would be within the EU um, because the EU has um, competence has exclusive competence to negotiate our trade deals. So we would be, in, so we would have to take over the EU. Exactly. Um, very brief comment, gentlemen, if you have one. I think, I mean, one thing to bear in mind when we're talking about GMOs, if, if, if we came out, the UK government might be disposed to be much more liberal to GMOs. Or much less? Well, possibly. Depends if you're talking about this government or the next one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess. And, uh, and England rather than yeah, Scotland yeah, and yeah, Wales yeah. as well, yeah. once you get into all that as well. Yeah, yeah. 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 devolution has a part to play here. Um, Anna. Yeah, thanks. Um, I've got a question about public health building on the comment from Friends of the Earth. Um, so given that you know health is a member state issue and we've talked quite a lot about 
um, sustainable diets and the you know impacts on climate change. But I guess what are the prospects um, for public health being a more prominent concern within CAP? And it particularly builds on Tim your work on horticulture and the big opportunity that there is for better investment in horticulture, particularly in the UK. Um, I suppose the question that you know. At, 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 is it a distant dream to be able to actually talk about CAP and the links to public health in the future, or are there opportunities that we should be thinking about in a context of remaining? Um, it's a, well, for me, this is the big one. Uh, I think the prospects are as good as the public pressure. It's back to Kira's sort of point and the discussion we were having about about. Uh, well, I thought uh, Mr. Finch is very welcome faith that the environmental NGOs will shape public policy. Um, I think that, well, the, the problem is there is fierce resistance at the EU level to member states having devolved responsibility over health. Because health, actually, at the EU level is largely health care. NHS is the equivalent and health insurance. But there is a creeping in of EU, uh, not competence, but uh, preparedness to act and to fund a little bit. And it's happened over horticulture, actually. Uh, horticulture and some waste disposal, uh, surplus uh, food sch schemes, um, but it's been done in the name of health. And some funding of marketing and health education through the EU. But this is tiny. It's not even a blip in the 40% of EU funding. Uh, but rhetorically, I mean, Wynne knows better than I will ever know, um, that health is much more of the language at the European Parliament level than even at the Council level. It was shaken by the BSE and uh, those crises. And many of us see uh, another crisis coming with antimicrobial resistance and the food industry's involvement in that. So I think this could become very big politics, and who knows what will happen. But I don't see a major shift, and to be honest, uh, not, not in my lifetime. Uh, but I see the pressure outside for injecting health into sustainability is huge. It goes back to Laura Wellsley's, both her work and Chesman's work, that it's coming around carbon and meat, and meat and its impact, and meat and dairy's impact on, on public health. And there's a really interesting coming together of environmental concerns with public health concerns. You know, people like me, as you know, call it ecological public health. And I think, interesting, at a meeting I was in, in Rome last week, that was the language. And one, my colleague, Karen Hawkes, here, is involved as on the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food, a project looking at the world. That, that sort of ecological public health thinking is becoming much more the, the new wave of thinking. I see entering in. That will, in EU terms, you know, we're talking about over the next 10 years. It's not going to happen next week, which is why people like me are, are nervous about um, Brexit, because it dislocates that slow accrual of policy. Um, I'm going to really interrupt. No, no, that's it. Then another question. I mean, Wait, is that enough quick, of an answer? Well, the only thing I'd say is I'm a degree with that. Yes, I do agree, broadly speaking. I'm, I'm just a bit concerned about, you know, whether DG Agri is taking these sorts of things on board. Yeah. You know, whether their mental map really includes these sorts of issues. No, I agree. It's it good enough to get them to take climate change on yes. board. No, I take the point. But the pressure on DG Agri mm -hmm. is growing. Yeah. I think that's what we should take. Um, I'm Alan um, So, I'm a unsubsidised farmer. Be my passion if people talk about farmers, they also talked about growers. Um, what I wanted to, I have a question to ask, but I just wanted to say that for the last two years we've probably had the best English agriculture in this country, but we've had the worst prices. And the reason we've had the worst prices is because Russia put up a barrier, and all the Polish apples would have gone to Russia, into England. My question is the fact, and I love the point when Tim said he liked to be a horticulturist. Um, I'm Joe Blocks, and I supply um, Tesco's or Sainsbury's or something with salads. To make it really possible, I have to supply them 52 weeks of the year. 
to grow salad 52 weeks a year. I grow some in England, and I grow some in Europe. Now, I'd like to know, would I be better inside Europe or, or outside Europe for my purely my business thing? Well, it's very simple. In. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's an absolute no-brainer. There is not a fruit and vegetable supplier or retailer, as you know, Teresa, uh, who doesn't say stay in for precisely that reason, because okay. they've got flexibility in supply chain. Whether you're an organic box scheme, you know, Guy Watson's done exactly this. He's created a, a pan-European supply chain in order to provide his boxes with the organic produce. <laughs> Really quickly. Quickly. Yeah, I mean, I think it would just depend to some extent on what sort of agreement we we'll have with the EU subsequent to, mm -hmm. to Brexit. And that, that would be quite important. And the things they're banning us from having, yeah. which yeah. are not right. on, so. yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sorry. Yeah, go on. I would just want to say very quickly, um, if there was Brexit, there's a question that you might, if you were supplying, um, from, if you were getting your supplies from Europe as well, the price might go up if, the tar if there's tariffs in the way. But two horticultural tariffs, as you know, Theresa, is 11%, sugar is 30%. You know, this is the uncertainty world. Right, what? The world is uncertain. The yeah. fact is, you know, what will the EU be doing in five years? Will the euro still be existing? Will Greece be a part of the EU? Will giant dinosaurs roam the earth again? Everything's would, would uncertain. Be the no, fact no, is, why if, would she be better just, off but I had to stop this uncertainty with because I get it in every single debate. Everything. True. It's it's never ending positive at all. Uncertainty. You don't want to go out there. It's all scary. But so I just want to stop this. But I why would she be better I want to talk about Theresa's example now. Theresa, I don't know, and nor do any of these people. It depends on what the agreement will be. Anyone who tells you for for certain that they're right is not telling you the truth. Nobody knows. As far as I'm concerned, what we want is an equitable free trade agreement as best we can manage. I couldn't promise you anything different, and I wouldn't, because that'd be telling poor things. Uh, I, I wish you the best with your business, and I wish I could grow apples, because mine are rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, um, we have about six minutes before the people that you can hear will come politely, I'm sure, and throw us out. Um, can I ask Anna to uh, have some closing thoughts? Yes. Um, so, hi, everyone. Anna from the Food Foundation. Thank you all so much for coming, and I think really want to say a huge thank you to our speakers and um, panellists. It's been a really rich discussion and to all of you for great comments and questions. I think um, on behalf of the Food Foundation, the Food Ethics Council and the Food Research Collaboration for all collectively sponsored this event, a very big thank you. And I think my, my personal takeaway is that um, one way or another, healthy and sustainable diets need to be much of a much higher political priority, whether we're in Europe or we're not in Europe and all of us have a lot more work to do to try and um, increase the pressure on government, make this a, um, make it a political priority and um, so more events like this, more discussion, um, more bringing the evidence to the fore, putting it in front of policy makers is the work that's got to be done and um, I know we'll all continue to do that going forward. So thank you very much Charlotte, you've been fantastic um, and thank you all to the panellists and the speakers.